Well, good evening and welcome once again to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Mars Hill Baptist Church. My name is Daniel Gregory. I'm pastor here and we're so glad that you have chosen to join us for our weekly Bible study. We're going through the uh, Gospel of Mark in this series entitled Walking with Jesus Through Mark. And tonight's message is in, entitled, If There Is No Will, There's No Way. If there's no will, there's no way. And uh, that title will, uh, will make a lot of sense as we go through uh, the short passage that we're looking tonight in Mark's Gospel in the third chapter. Um, if you ask people this question, what is something you cannot live without? Um, a good amount of the time, people will answer, well, I can't live without my family. If you ask them, you know, what's most important in your life? My family. And you know, many wonderful things have been said about the family. Uh, Peter Buffett said this, it didn't matter how big our house was, it mattered that there was love in it. Beautiful quote about family there. Jane Howard Call it a clan, call it a network, call it a tribe, call it a family. Whatever you call it, whoever you are, you need one. In the uh, movie Coco, there was uh, this, uh, this quote, We may have our differences, but nothing's more important than family. And probably my, mo my, my favorite one is George Bernard Shaw said this, A happy family is but an earlier heaven. You know, our families mean so much to us. But you know, of all the families that we can be a part of, whether it be a family of, of friends, whether it be our, our genetic family, uh, the ones that we know our mom and our dad and our brothers and sisters and all, the most important family that we can be part of is the family of God. You know, family is what Jesus is talking about here in Mark 3, verses 31 through 35. He talks about who his family is. And you know, some of the most important information that we can ever have in life is how can we be part of God's family? How can I know that I am a part of the family of God? And in this passage, Jesus answers that very question. And, you know, it, it's so important because, you know, if, if you're anything like me, I know I can be wrong. Um, I, I can tell you of time after time I have been wrong about things. I, uh, I was so sure the other week that one of uh, my daughter's teachers was going to have a birthday. I, I just knew it. I was like, it's Wednesday. I know it's going to be then. We need to celebrate it. And then I went in on my calendar and I was like, my goodness, I'm like four and a half weeks off on this. I was completely wrong. So you know what? This idea of the most important information about being a part of God's family, we need to check ourselves. We need to make sure about what it means to be in God's family, to make sure that we are part of God's family. And I want to make sure I say this too. I'm not doing this lesson to make you doubt your faith. I'm not doing this to, to crumble your faith or anything like that. I don't want you to doubt your salvation. I want us to know. I want us to know what Jesus said, that we might be on the right foundation. And not only that, but we would be able to give that information out as well. So look with me, if you will, Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 31, and going to the end of the chapter to verse 35. And his mother, speaking of Jesus' mother, and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside, seeking you. And he, being Jesus, answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Real quick tonight, I want to look at three truths. 
Three truths about being part of God's family. Three very important truths. Some that we might need to answer somebody about. Somebody might have a question about what it is to be a part of the family of God. They might have a, a, a bad idea about what that is. They might have some false information. And these truths that we're going to look at are going to help us to enlighten us, to encourage us, to inform us, to make sure our feet are on the right foundation to be a part of God's family, but also it's going to equip us to inform others. So three truths. The first is this. Being part of God's family has nothing to do with genetics. Being part of God's family has nothing to do with genetics. We go back and we see Jesus is being popular. You can go all the way back into this chapter and there are crowds following him around. So much so we've seen in this, uh, in this chapter that Jesus wasn't even being able to, uh, to get a meal. He wasn't able to eat. People were just crowding him and wanting to hear his teaching, wanting to see his miracles. There were people that were coming to Jesus. And here he is, um, here he is in, uh, in this situation where he's, he's obviously by himself and his mom and his, his brothers are coming and they're coming to get him. We don't know exactly why they're coming to get him. They might be saying, hey, you need a meal. We need to get you away from this crowd. They might have even been saying like they had before, hey, you're out of your mind. They might be trying to want to talk to him saying, hey, Jesus... You need to stop this. We're, we're not too, um, um, we're, we're not 100% sure, but what we do know is this, that what Jesus said here was somewhat shocking. Here it was, his mom and his brothers were there. We know Jesus had brothers and he had sisters. We found that out in, Mar in Matthew's Gospel that he had a, a pretty big family. After he was born, Mary and Joseph had more children. But here he is, he says this thing, who is my family, basically? Who's my brother and my sister and my mom? Who are these people? And, and this was a very shocking thing because family was something that was very important. We look throughout the scriptures. We look at all of what is in, um, we look at all of these things um, in, in the Bible where, where we have all these phone book passages. We're reading a lot of those, um, well, we're reading a lot, of, um, uh, a lot about uh, the different thing, uh, those things in the book of Joshua. Sorry, I, I flubbed my words a little bit there. In the book of Joshua, we go through and we have a lot of these uh, passages that just have names in them. If you go into Kings and Chronicles, there is name after name after name after name. It is because it was of utmost importance to have this lineage to tell people what tribe they had come from, to be able to trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham, to be able to say, hey, look, look who my family is. It was a very important thing within the society in which Jesus uh, was living and when Jesus asks this, he means it to elicit a response. And it brings us to this very simple realization. When Jesus was saying, hey, who is a part of my family? It was saying he, it has nothing to do with your DNA. It has nothing to do with that family tree, with all of those names that had come before you. It was something greater than that. Which notice this too, because this is a powerful truth. No one has always been a Christian. Let me say that again. No one has always been a Christian. If you were to ask my mom and my dad, how long have I been their son? Well, most likely they're going to think a little bit, and they, you know, they might get pretty exact. They probably could tell you my age, and, and you know, so many months beyond that, and uh, tell you, well, you know, he was born on so and so a day, and and all. But the reality is, is I've always been their son. 
Ever since I was conceived, I was their son. There has never been a time I have not been my mom and dad's son. It's not so true with God. Because there is a time and a place in a moment of surrender, an acceptance of the gospel, that we are, as the Bible says, born again. There's a point in time where we are not part of God's family. Then we come to Jesus Christ. We surrender our lives. We ask forgiveness of our sins. We acknowledge Christ as Lord of our life. And we are adopted into His family, becoming a son or a daughter of God. See, that's the idea of being born again. And that begs the question, what relationship do you have with Jesus Christ? And on what is that, uh, on what is that relationship, what is it being built upon? See, it's one of the things that we have to, uh, we have to realize. That unless we have that foundation built upon Jesus Christ himself, then we are not a part of God's family. Jesus is clear in the Gospels. We are clear in the New Testament that those are a part of the household of faith, that those that are ones that have uh, accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, those that are in the faith, they're the ones that are saved. Those that are part of the family of God. Those that have not are not part of the family of God. Now, this gives us two amazing and wonderful and, and just absolutely mind-blowing truths. The first is this. It doesn't matter what our background is. If it doesn't have to deal with genetics, that means it doesn't matter who you are. Your past your present, it doesn't matter your family tree, you can be a part of God's family. In fact, we see in the scriptures that there are zealots, there are tax collectors, there are thieves, murderers, liars, cheats, legalists, self-righteous religionists, and all kinds of other sinners. And what do they do? They come to Christ and they're all part of the family of God. We see it in the disciples. There are disciples that if you looked at one's background, you look at the other background, you'd be like, you know what? They're going to kill each other, but they didn't. Why? Because they had found a new family in God. That's the amazing news. But here's, here's another little hard truth. Because Jesus here is indicating to be part of his family, it, it has nothing to do with genetics. It has everything to do with faith. Therefore, we have to be really careful on what we base our Christianity on. Because there's many in this world that base their faith on saying, well, my mom and dad are, are Christians. My mom and my dad, well, they, they brought me to church. And my dad was a deacon and my mom taught Sunday school. And my sister sang in the choir, I ought to be good. But you know what? It doesn't work like that. It is a personal relationship. We don't get a relationship with God based on our grandparents. We don't get a relationship with God based on our moms and our dads. We get a relationship with God when we come and accept the gospel, when we accept Christ into our lives. It's not because of a neighbor or a family relation. It is because of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus in this one question shows that his family isn't based on genetics. It's not based on that family tree. It is personal and it can't be decided by somebody else. It's one-on-one. -on -one. You know, think about taking a vitamin. We take vitamins to make sure you know, we're healthy and strong and all those good things. They're good for you. They're supposed to help you. But they can only help you is if you actually take it. Your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your child, your grandchildren, all of them can take vitamins, but you know what? It doesn't do you one bit of good. Why? Because it's a personal thing. Many people think mom and dad have Jesus, therefore I do, and it's not like that. 
Jesus asked this insanely important question, who are my family? Who's part of my family? Because it's not based on genetics. It's not based on any of those things. It's based on that personal relationship. For those that might encounter this question, those that might talk to somebody at home or at work or at school or just out and about, you might have a, a relationship you're witnessing with someone. Let me give you a little uh, a help. You can ask uh, where someone's faith is plugged into. You know, if I have a lamp and I need it to light up, I need it to have power, I'm going to go to a source of power. I'm going to plug it in to that wall outlet. Our faith is the same way. To activate it, to make it come alive, for us to have spiritual life, we've got to plug it into the place that has power. And you know what? There is only one that ever rose from the dead. There's only one that died on the cross for our sins. There's only one that claimed to be the Son of God. There's only one that was a part of the Trinity that came to be our Savior. There's only one that meets all of those. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is where we plug our faith into. Because there's only one power source, and that is Jesus Himself. Being part of the family of God has nothing to do with genetics. But also notice this second truth. Number two, being part of the family of God has nothing to do with being a groupie for Jesus. It has nothing with me about being a groupie for Jesus. Look at verse 34, just the first part. And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, just stop there. I want to borrow some words for, from Dr. Daniel Aiken because he, he says this so, so well. He says, if physical relationships are not the key to a spiritual relationship with God, what else might be ruled out? What else might be a false perspective on this crucial issue? Verse 34 provides this insight. This room is crowded. It's filling to over capacity with those that were attracted to Jesus. Jesus is groupies, if you will. There were those that loved his teaching. There were those that loved hearing his voice. There were those that loved his miracles. There were those that loved it when he cast out a demon. There were those that loved the show, that loved the power. But you know what? So often the crowd that came for the show didn't stay when Jesus said, follow me. So we want to make sure we have a proper perspective. The crowds in the Gospel of Mark, if you look, they're not, uh, they're not spoken of in a favorable light. They were present, they were there because that was what Jesus' ministry just attracted. But so often that crowd just dissipated when things got tough, when things got real. Crowds did not follow and stay for the long haul with Jesus. You know who did? It was individuals who realized who Jesus was and said, you know what? There's nobody else I need to follow. I need to follow Jesus. Hence, Jesus looked around and said, you know what? I'm going to take all y'all in. I'm going to ask you, you know, who, who is it that are, are my brothers? And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you who it is. Notice all the people that were around. The, the disciples were around, including Judas. There were most likely scribes of the Jerusalem. There were probably some Pharisees. There might have even been some Herodians there. There were those that were healed of disease. Those were healed of demon possession. There were those that were curious. And there were those uh, people following Jesus for various different reasons. Some are good and some are bad. Some follow for who he is and some follow for who they make him out to be. And it begs the question, why are you following Jesus? Some follow Jesus because it's the only thing they've ever known. I just might as well keep doing it. And never dig down deeper and find out who Jesus is. Some do it for selfish gain. Well, I want to I follow Jesus because he's going to bless my life. 
He's going to give me money. He's going to give me health. He's going to give me wealth. He's going to prosper my life. He's going to bless me. Some just follow to get something out of it. But some follow because they say, this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is no one else in this world worth following. Everyone else is unworthy. Only Jesus deserves my faith and my devotion. Only Jesus deserves this because he saved my soul. Friends, listen. Groupies for Jesus don't know him as Savior. You wear the t-shirt, you come to church, you get all excited about the same uh, things of God, but you don't know Jesus as Savior. Why? Because you're just there for the thrill. See, there's a difference between just sitting and getting excited and truly knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus, as he was looking around, he was making a point. Who's my brothers and my sisters? Who is my family? Because he was looking out at all of these and there were certainly ones there that had no desire to follow Jesus. They were trying to trap him. There were certainly there those that were there saying, yeah, he's talking, but when's he going to do a miracle? He was getting across this point of asking, why exactly are you following me? You ever watch the Westminster Kennel Dog Show? You think, uh, I believe it's on Christmas Day, it's broadcast. It's really neat. You see all of these really, really fancy, expensive dogs. Well, Netflix, not terribly long ago, um, did kind of like a behind-the-scenes documentary of, of what all was going on with contestants for the Westminster Kennel Show. And uh, I, I will say this. It was cool to see all those dogs, and I love dogs. I am a dog person. They are man's best friend. I love being around dogs. They are great. But you know what? I'm not a dog owner. There is a big difference between being a dog lover. If you have a dog, I will play with your dog. I will pet it. I will go. If you want me to take it for a walk, I'll take it for a walk. I, I love being around dogs. But I'm not a dog owner. There's a huge difference between those two. This Netflix documentary showed me what all happens to these dogs. They are bathed over and over and over and over again, multiple times a day. They have trainers, they have vets, they eat better food than I do. Thousands upon thousands of dollars are poured in to these dogs. Why? Because their owners are dedicated. The same is true of Jesus Christ. The groupies, oh, we're there for the show. But the true followers, when Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me, they look around and they say, all right, where's my cross? Jesus, the road ahead might be tough, but where else can I go? The road ahead, yeah, it's going to lead to heartache and pain and difficulty, but Jesus, where else can I go? I've got to follow you. Friends, which are you? Are you a spectator? Or are you one with Jesus has pointed to and said, follow me, and you got your cross and said, all right, Jesus. As the song says, wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Being part of the family of God has nothing to do with being a groupie for Jesus. Finally, this, real quick. Being part of the family of God has everything to do with doing the will of God. Look at the end of verse 34 and the beginning of and verse 35. Here are my mother and my brother, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now this is hugely significant for two parts. The first one is the one that we often miss because we're not a part of this culture and a part of this time in which Jesus uh, taught. And that is this. When Jesus said, here is my brother and here is my mother and here is my sister and here is my family, that was legally binding. It was something that people could say, wait a minute here. He said I was part of the family, therefore I'm part of the family, therefore I should get an inheritance. Which, yes, there is a huge theological significance to that. 
Jesus was saying something shocking, but he was giving it with such an amazing, uh, an amazing command, amazing indication here. He was saying, listen, my family are those that do God's will. And I want to make sure I say this. This isn't work salvation. It doesn't have to deal with, oh, I've got to work my salvation. It is about a heart that says, God, whatever you want me to do. God, whatever your will is. God, whatever it is you want me to do, that's what I want. And we read throughout the scriptures what is God's great desire, that his children would come to him for forgiveness. The very first thing, the greatest thing that God desires for us is that we would be saved, to confess him as Lord, to believe on his name, and to follow him. You've probably experienced this at some point in time in your life, either from a grandmother, a mother, somebody like that, that says, oh, hey, dinner's ready. Go wash your hands. I remember my grandmother would say that. Mom would say that. And, uh, you know, we'd be at my, my grandmother's house, and, you know, you knew when food was going to be on the table. And what'd you do? You ran to the bathroom. Whether you wanted to or not, it could have been that you were playing with bleach before that. You were like, I got to wash my hands. And you'd go in and you would wash your hands and get them as clean as could be because you knew what was coming. There was a desire to partake of all of the wonderful things that were prepared. But what was the will of my mom and my grandmother and those that were in charge? Go wash your hands. God has a will for each and every one of us. There's a generic will in, in respects to following God's law and God's commands of how to live our life. There's a specific will as we're in different places in our life, different jobs, different families, different cultures, different opportunities. And there's a will He has for us to shine the light of Christ, to be Jesus, to share love in those different situations. But you know, the first and the foremost will that God has for each and every one on this planet is just that one simple thing to come to Christ and to know Him as Lord and Savior. To be adopted into that family. You know what? That's the blessing of this passage. That every single person can follow the will of God. Can take that first step. Can heed that call. Hey, come wash your hands. To say, hey, come, have your souls washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. To be made whole again, to be adopted into God's family. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your family tree. It doesn't matter your present circumstances. That call goes out to each and every one. Because God, Christ was giving it right then. He was giving it to all of those that were seated around him. Those that were his enemies those that were his friends, those that were his disciples, those that were set against him. He was giving it out and saying, listen, it doesn't matter who you are. The will of God is right before you to simply come and receive the forgiveness of God. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And after that, everything, uh, everything changes. See, that's in that title. If there's no will, there's no way. So friends, the, the big question for tonight is, are you doing the will of God? Have you taken that first step? Have you taken the first step in giving your life over to Jesus Christ? It's as simple as acknowledging the fact that you have done wrong in your life. Wrong before God, wrong before those that are around you. That you stand condemned, that you stand guilty before a, a perfect and holy God. That you are in deserving, uh, that, that you deserve punishment. But the second part of that is simply believing that God has already taken that punishment that you deserve. That Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life. And as he died on the cross, he took the punishment that you were supposed to have. He took the punishment for the sins of the world. He died, was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. 
power so great the grave could not hold him. The third part is simply confessing, believing that Jesus did all of those things and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is master over your life to ask for forgiveness of sins. And the promise of the Word of God, if anyone would do that, that they would be saved. But you know what? The second part of that is to all of those that are believers in Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus was saying this, He was saying it not only as that first step, but also the continuation of a life following after the will of our Father, following after the things of Scripture, following after the will that God has for our own lives personally, following after the will of God that He would have for our ministries, for the things that we would do in life. So tonight, is there a will in your life and it is is it God's will bow with me in a word of prayer as we close Father God thank you so much for your word thank you for the lessons that we have from it and Lord thank you for the direction that it gives us and Lord I pray now that you'd help us help us to examine our lives to see if your will is there for anyone who has heard this message that does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would bring conviction, that you would help them, that they might know you as Lord and Savior. For those of us that know you as Savior and King, I pray that you would help us to continue to do your will, that we might bring glory and honor to your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I do hope the Lord blessed you this evening as we've studied together. I also uh, I will encourage you to be in attendance uh, at church this Sunday. This particular Sunday, um, we won't be having our live stream. Uh, we're not able to do that this Sunday, but we're having a very special guest speaker, um, Russ Reeves from the Baptist State Convention will be coming. He'll be giving a great message on the book of Acts, Acts 1, uh, verses 1 through 11. So I really encourage you to be part of that as it will be a tremendous message. And uh, I know you'll be encouraged and challenged in your spiritual life there. Uh, please don't forget, uh, we do have prayer room at 930, uh, from 930 to right about 945. Then after that at 10 o'clock, we have our Sunday school. And then 11 o'clock, we have our morning worship service. Church, I love you. I miss you. Can't wait to see you again. Until that time, may God richly bless you. Good night.